welcome. Thank you all for coming tonight, helping us uh, celebrate Mother's Day with uh, our own soon-to-be mother herself here, Kate. Um, some of you may know Kate, um, probably many of you do, but uh, her official title is museum technician, but that really doesn't describe what she does here. Um, she not only works with the objects, dusting, cleaning, all that kind of stuff, picking up when I break things. She, she also does a lot of the research with Chris, um, helping out with researchers, and uh, who knows how many projects she has of her own, um, digitizing letters and reading things, and helping uh, us and the intern staff find what we need um, to, uh, to tell the great stories of this house. So she's a, a huge part of our team here. And a couple of months ago, um, well, actually probably longer ago than that now, this winter, she first uh, brought up the idea of, of doing this program sort of in passing one day at lunch. And I, I'm not sure she was really serious about it. But after she brought it up, I wasn't going to let her forget. And after a month or two of begging and pleading, she finally agreed officially to do the talk. So we're very excited um, for what she's going to tell us about Fanny's experiences with, with motherhood and pregnancy and childbirth and all of that. So um, if you would, please join me in welcoming Kate hanson Platts. Later, in 1843, she would marry Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and become uh, Frank Fanny Longfellow or Francis Longfellow. Uh, and fairly quickly thereafter, she would start uh, her journey of motherhood and parenthood. Uh, in 1844, the oldest son, Charles Appleton Longfellow, came along. Uh, just over a year later, uh, son number two, Ernest Wadsworth Longfellow, uh, there was a bigger gap before their first daughter in 1847, Fanny. Her I'll call her baby Fanny to distinguish her from mom Fanny. Uh, in 1850, so a, a little bit more of a gap, uh, comes the next girl, Alice Mary Longfellow, followed again by two more sisters, Edith and Anne in 1853 and 1855. Uh, as you can see, there's a significant time span um, over the course of, of these experiences. And her experience of number one is going to be significantly different than her experience of number six. Uh, so bear that in mind as I'm making generalizations about the, the evidence that I've been able to find. Um, I started becoming interested in how Fanny experienced pregnancy as I started to experience pregnancy and preparing for uh, birth and new motherhood. Uh, so I can't say that I'm an expert, but I've working on, uh, in part from my own experiences, because I really do think that they carry over um, across time. We have a different social situation, we have different choices available to us, uh, but the, the basic experience uh, really have, is, I think, is universal. Um, I have been fortunate enough to use some great resources that we have at the site uh, for the first pregnancy, again, the the experience of the first is going to be different than the sixth. Uh, for her first pregnancy, Fanny Longfellow kept a journal. Uh, she began in, in January 1844, when she was already pregnant with Charlie, uh, the oldest son. She ended it July 13, 1844, uh, on her first wedding anniversary. Uh, she really hadn't made any entries up, to, up until that point since the recording of the birth of Charlie. So this journal takes her through the the second half of her first pregnancy. And because it is a personal journal, has some nice personal insights. She didn't keep a journal for the rest of her kids. She did keep a what she called the Chronicles of the Children of Castle Craigie. 
Um, so she recorded anecdotes on her children, uh, updates on their lives, uh, and it also got sparser as she had more children to take care of. <laughs> uh, uh, so I used that in part as well, but this is really her, her personal thoughts, uh, chronicles she was keeping as a baby book. We do have an extensive correspondence. Anne Longfellow Pierce is Fanny's sister-in-law. She was living in Portland. Uh, fortunately for us, she was living at a distance, so they <laughs> corresponded and wrote things down. Um, and she really does seem to be very close to Anne Pierce, and she's willing to share a lot with Anne Pierce. So that's a particularly rich source. She also writes to her best friend, Emmeline Austin Wadsworth, um, not directly related to the rest of the Wadsworths I'm naming here. Um, Emmeline is her closest friend growing up in Boston, and they, they stay very close through the, the years of early years of Fanny's marriage, which coincide with this with her first pregnancies. Mary Longfellow Greenleaf is another sister-in-law. Zilpa Wadsworth Longfellow is her mother-in-law, a key figure in here. I don't have a portrait of uh, Mary Appleton McIntosh, who is uh, Fanny's sister. Uh, who was living abroad in England and uh, St. Kitts uh, during Fanny's pregnancies. So she has a more interrupted correspondence. When it's there, there's some really great uh, information, but it's not as often there. And of course, the person that's really missing here is Maria Theresa Appleton, who was Fanny's mother who had died when Fanny was a girl. Uh, Fanny does not have that support structure of her mother in place, uh, which I think changes how she relates in particular to, uh, to Zilpa, to Henry's mother. So, like I said, my research method was to start reading through the correspondence at the times when I knew she was pregnant, based on the delivery date. I made some assumptions there. I assumed a full-term pregnancy and, and counted backwards. Uh, so give or take a few weeks, I might be off. Uh, and I tried to read very carefully because sometimes the references are pretty subtle. Uh, given the, the social mores, uh, what you did and didn't talk about. So there's a fine line I, I found between uh, trying to interpret something that's, that might be there as subtext and making something up because I want it to be there. <laughs> so I'm going to try to stay on the, on the uh, historically accurate side of that line. Uh, symptoms are a key example of this. Uh, she consistently reported influenza and fatigue, extreme fatigue, that was her excuse for not writing more often. And these really coincide with the first three months of her pregnancies. Mm -hmm. So I want to believe that they're related to morning sickness, to, the, to early pregnancy fatigue, uh, though I can't say for sure. Sometimes uh, she does get more, um, more explicit. Uh, at 19 weeks with Charlie, so her, her first pregnancy, she reported to Ann Pierce, I have been remarkably well thus far, as I am very prudent and lead a very quiet life. There is every, there is every reason to believe all will go as well with me as the circumstances admit. Sometimes they're a lot more subtle when I try to read into it. At nine weeks with uh, daughter Alice, she writes, uh, I have been feeling so miserably the past month, all writing was an exertion. Nothing ails me but a general debility, which our unusually mild winter and the heat of the house have kept up. Uh, so she's reporting to her friends and family that she's not feeling well, she's under the weather, but she's also ha hastening to assure them that nothing's really wrong. There's just, just something going on, uh, which leads me to, to tie it, the two together. Uh, by the end of her pregnancy, Fanny's a little more open about discussing her physical condition. Um, and here she's mostly talking about the physical unwillingness that can come along with the, the later uh, stages of pregnancy. At 35 weeks, so getting close to the, the end in that third trimester, she writes, uh, I'm remarkably free from all stiffness and discomfort at night, which so many complain of, and sometimes think it must all be a joke that anything is to happen. <laughs> this is pregnancy number one. Uh, at 38 weeks with pregnancy number four, so right where we start to consider them full term, uh, I have had 
very good nights on the whole, and toler tolerably comfortable days, but a general rheumatic feeling and inability to take much exercise annoys me a good deal. Still no reason to complain. I suffer so much less than others. So overall, her pregnancies seem to be fairly easy, at least as she's comparing to, to others in her social circles. Um, and again, at 30, 38 weeks, uh, she writes uh, to her mother-in-law, I hope you do not feel very anxious about me. I have been very prudent of late and much stronger in consequence, and to doubt not all will go as well as possible. I am daily expecting the event and she'll be very well content to have it speedily accomplished. <laughs> so she's ready for, ready for the, that baby to get here. Uh, Henry also commented occasionally on uh, Fanny's physical state. I'm occasionally going to use some of uh, Henry's words, uh, although I've tried really to stick to Fanny's uh, own experience. But I couldn't resist him reporting uh, when she's 32 weeks pregnant, she's uh, just into her third trimester. She, Henry's writing to her brother Tom, Fanny is pretty well, though not so nimble on her feet as usual. <laughs> He's got yeah, a little more, more explosive than she is. Uh, one of the things that I uh, consistently saw as parallel to a new parent's experience today are the, the emotions, the thoughts and feelings that uh, new parents go through in preparing, um, in going through pregnancy. Maternal mortality was certainly a concern in the Victorian period, uh, although Fanny doesn't really actively voice those concerns. She does refer to birth as the crisis uh, on a couple of occasions. Uh, she does remark that other people consider this a very dangerous time, just on a couple of occasions, but she doesn't express her own fears about it very much. What she does express fears about are, am I ready for this? How is this going to change my life? <laughs> um, which I can like, relate to. <laughs> uh, she wrote uh, in her journal, again, that, that personal journal, feel sometimes an awe and fear of myself, a fear that my heart is not pure and holy enough to give its lifeblood, perhaps its nature, to another. What an awful responsibility is already upon me. And then a few weeks later, uh, looking out at Henry, he writes, Henry took his sunset row on the river, sat at window and, and followed the flashing of his oars with my eyes and heart. How completely my life is bound up in this love. And he loves me to the uttermost, to the uttermost desire of my heart. Can any child excite such strong passion as this we feel for each other? How is this going to change my life? How is my, my first baby going to change my relationship with my husband? Uh, overwhelmingly though, her expressions are of hope and promise and looking forward to the future. She uh, tipped her hand a little bit uh, before she announced her pregnancy to her sister-in-law. Uh, sis when she finally did, Anne wrote to her, an expression in your previous letter had prepared me for the good news. Uh, and I think that she's referring to this line in Fanny's New Year's letter where she says, my grateful heart glances over the last year and all that this promises me. Mm. So she's, she's getting a little ahead of herself before she's ready to mm. share the news. Um, 35 weeks pregnant with, with Charlie. So she's, again, in that third trimester. She's uh, probably a, a little bit bigger. The Longfellows had been renting uh, a really interesting rental arrangement where they were sharing the house with the Worcester family, who had, uh, who had just moved out to their new construction, uh, what was then next door. Now it's three doors down. Uh, so Fanny writes, the night that they finally moved out, the house entirely ours tonight, ran like a child through the rooms to enjoy the feeling of possession that felt the desolation likewise. Cannot resist planning for the future with a confidence in life and happiness I never knew before, and yet I'm so near what is thought a dangerous crisis. Be moderate in heart, hopes, O oh heart. So again, overwhelmingly, she's, she's positive about the future. She's looking forward to this new experience. She's 35 weeks pregnant, running through the house. <laughs> <laughs> that image in her minds again. Um, but she's trying to keep herself tempered. She knows that, that things can and may go wrong, although we know in hindsight that they don't end up going wrong for her. And the other thing that kept cropping up that new parents 
uh, today I can certainly relate to, is gender expectations and gender disappointment. She did not have her ultrasound in the uh, uh, late first trimester to tell her you know, it's a boy, it's a girl. She didn't get her early DNA test <laughs> telling her what she was expecting. She wanted a girl. She very clearly wanted a girl. Uh, and was somewhat disappointed in the, the first couple boys. Uh, well, I'll talk about her preparation, some of the preparations she began. They're all in pink. For the first two pregnancies, they're all pink. Uh, every, every time she mentions color. After she has Ernie, she, she does write uh, in a letter to, again, to her, to her sister Mary. So the, the few things they do go through are, are very revealing. She says, I was greatly disappointed, as you can imagine, to not welcome a daughter, having set my heart so much upon it, that I felt quite sure of her appearance, but I'm very well reconciled to my little boy. <laughs> so she, she got over it. Uh, she, she really did love her two little boys, who are pictured here in uh, 1849. However, when uh, the girls did come along uh, in one of uh, Henry's birth announcements, he reported on Edith, I am happy to tell you that Fanny has a daughter and is very glad it is one, and all is well. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of announcing, this is not how they got to announce their pregnancies. They didn't get to do the clever photoshops and the, uh, the clever pregnancy announcements that we might see today. However, they're almost, they're, they're more personal. Uh, I'm not going to try and make you read that, but you <laughs> to, to take a stab if you'd like. This is Fanny's, this is Fanny's handwriting. Uh, so this is what I've been um, coming through to try to find these, these gems. Writing to uh, her sister-in-law, Ann Pierce, at 19 weeks pregnant with uh, Charlie. I refer to the above to my health in a way that, which may puzzle you. I will explain myself by informing you then, in plain terms, of what you have a right to know, in that somewhere between May and June, I hope to give you a little nephew, or niece, for you to exercise all your outly capacities of affection and interest upon. You can read our hearts, although so much separated from us, and therefore need not be told how grateful we feel to God for this promised addition to our happiness. Again, the first announcement and the later announcements are a little different. By the time we get to Alice, number four, 26 weeks along, also writing to uh, Ann Pierce. I forget if I have told you that I expect to be confined the latter part of September, and therefore I'm not able to go further from home during the summer, or we should pay you a visit. So the, the reason she's, she's coming out and saying this is that, this is the reason I can't travel up to Portland, Maine. Um, less, less effusive than the, than the first time. One of the things that I was really interested in the, the ideas around um, how we tend to think of the Victorians and, and their thoughts on what was allowed and, and being very prudish was traveling in society and going along with that maternity clothing. I don't have a picture of maternity clothing. <laughs> um, we really need if we, we had some identified in our collection. However, it was Fanny's regular clothing altered to fit, to accommodate the new shape. Um, doctors did advocate loosening, though not always abandoning, corsets during pregnancy. Um, and they did advise that the waist of breasts should be let out at an early period. So you're not, not supposed to be trying to hide it, according to, to mm -hmm. the published doctors. Uh, and at 24 weeks uh, with Charlie, I did find this, this gem. Uh, so 24 weeks, just as she's, uh, as one is generally starting to, to show, the shape is starting to change, she writes, uh, shop with Henry, Henry for dressmaker. I have outgrown my wedding dress, and it will no longer cover one beating heart only. Aww. So she has her, her wedding dress altered. Um, so she's reusing her clothing, changing it to fit her changing body. And a week later, at 25 weeks pregnant, she reported attending the ball given by her, her stepmother wearing that wedding dress, altered to fit. So she's not withdrawing from society. She's, she's not a shrinking violet. Um, she's not hiding herself away for, for nine months by any means. Um, and I feel like this is one of the, the common misconceptions about the prudish Victorians. Uh, 
She does skip some events when she's not feeling up to them. Uh, she, however, at 22 weeks pregnant with Alice, uh, her fourth baby, traveled to Washington, D.C. with her two boys, went to the White House and met President Taylor, <laughs> was presented. So again, 22 weeks, just about the t she's, she's probably visibly pregnant by that point, the altering her dresses. Um, at 25 weeks pregnant with Charlie, she attended that ball uh, her stepmother's with the altered dress. At 32 weeks pregnant with Charlie, uh, she recorded that Harriet, her stepmother, brought my share of wedding cake from a wedding that she had apparently skipped. So she's being selective in the events she attends. And by 33 weeks with Charlie, she records, can have nothing more to do with the chapel and its wearisome flights of stairs at present. <laughs> so it's a, a good excuse to, to stay home and avoid those. Um, and in the late or early third trimester with Ernie, uh, this letter is not dated, but we can pin it down to that um, to that vague period. Uh, As I have not been strong enough to go about it all of late, being ordered to great prudence from previous overexertion, I was at first in inclined to postpone Mary Ann's visit until I could be more useful to her. But as I felt as she volunteered coming, I thought it was perhaps most convenient to her not to be put off. Unfortunately, my Aunt Martha, who is a very kind and most excellent person, has done for her all I was prevented doing, and is a very pleasant companion for walks, etc. So in this instance, uh, she has a family member stepping in to act as a hostess for her, uh, and taking on that role. Um, otherwise, she, Mary Ann's her sister-in-law, so she is family, uh, but she's not feeling up to the task of uh, being a hostess, of being outgoing and showing her around Cambridge. Uh, so it seems to me that based on Fanny's own records of her events, of her uh, where she goes, that uh, it really d does depend on how she's feeling. It's not dictated by somebody. <coughs> hmm. uh, Fanny began collecting hmm. Baby clothing and furnishing, and furnishing her nursery uh, during her pregnancy, uh, particularly yeah. with Charlie, with the first one. As a expecting parent, can certainly relate to uh, doing all that shopping, um, getting nesting. <coughs> uh, most of the children's clothes were acquired commercially, uh, probably acquired from local seamstresses. Fanny recorded doing some sewing, but not a lot. She was. Uh, not an actor seamstress herself. She did receive gifts from family members. Uh, no formal baby shower, no big party, but she does record uh, Harriet, her stepmother, <coughs> brought diverse Lilliputian garments from Tom, from her brother. So Uncle Tom is, is sending, um, sending out some tiny little clothes for the expected baby. Anne Pierce, um, is crafty. She is uh, very skilled with the needle, and she writes, uh, offering again in advance of Charlie's birth, may I ask if your own fair hands are making any preparations, and if so, if my fingers cannot render you any acceptable aid. They are itching to be fabricating something to put in that drawer. Mm -hmm. Only do not know what it sh shall be. Do tell me <coughs> that, And so this is Fanny's uh, response. Many thanks for the kind pricking of your thumbs in my behalf. <laughs> my little wardrobe is filling up fast. Any additions, your sisterly or auntly interest may suggest to your nimble fingers will have an armory place therein above all other Lilliputian offerings. These prophetic wrappings excite sensations which must be felt to under be under which must be felt to be understood. As yet seem more real than the frame they are to serve, and not a little presumptuous to me. I wonder if Eve, despite her fig leaf teaching, provided herself seasonably for little Kane. <laughs> and that's, that's pure Fanny. That's <laughs> working in this. Read that again. <laughs> I can try it again. <laughs> so Fanny writes, many thanks for the kind pricking of your thumbs in my behalf. My little wardrobe is filling up fast, but any additions your sisterly or auntly interest may suggest to your nimble fingers will have an honorable place therein, 
above all the other Lilliputian <coughs> offerings. These prophetic wrappings excite sensations which must be felt to be understood, as yet seem more real than the frame they are to serve, and are not a little presumptuous to me. I wonder if Eve, despite her fig leaf teaching, provided herself seasonably for little Cain. We don't know if we have anything that um, Aunt Anne sent for the children. Uh, we do have some assorted baby caps, a few uh, little baby dresses. We also had baby booties in the collection. <laughs> and for Ernie, uh, Fanny wrote a thank you note uh, through her sister-in-law, or excuse me, through her mother-in-law, saying, pray thank dear Annie also very warmly for her charming little shoes which are exquisitely made and dainty enough for the foot of the princess royal. Mm -hmm. Again, that one of your girlfriend. <laughs> uh, we don't, I don't know that these are the ones that Anne made, um, but the, the charming little shoes that were handmade fit something like this, which are in our collection today, uh, although not identified with the provenance. For her subsequent children, Fanny had hand-me-downs um, from Charlie, uh, and she knew what she needed in, in the way of clothing. Uh, she did borrow patterns from friends to have clothing made up. Uh, she apparently had mislaid her own. She writes to, her again, her best friend, Emily, I have been bothered about the little robes, for I followed your pattern exactly, though by diligent hunting several of my old ones have turned up, luckily. And they are at least half a foot too short. I think you must have altered them without remembering it. I cannot take the trouble to have another dozen made, so shall keep them for nightgowns. Day two, when nobody is by, letting the flaming petticoat dangle beautifully below. Fortunately, it is very little matter, as they are not needed for long, and can afford to be spoiled better than the second set. But enough of such maternal troubles, though I must say all this fuss and preparation is very, very annoying after one has had a respite from it. <laughs> uh, this is 1850, so this is her fourth time around. Uh, so she's referring to the long skirted dresses and petticoats that the, the infants would have been put in, uh, no onesies, uh, <laughs> no easy changing access. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, Alice and baby, well, about one-year-old Edith. And you can see Edith is wearing short skirts. She's, she's been moved into them. Uh, and that would be that second set that Fanny mentioned. And we have better surviving evidence for the second set. Uh, they were used longer. They were probably a little more decorative uh, or patterned. And, uh, Babies weren't quite as messy at that point. <laughs> Give or take on that one. Uh, so they, these are shorter gowns that allowed them more freedom of movement as they began to walk, right, about one year old. Uh, Fanny recorded Charlie's first steps. Uh, they were taken at about a year old. The day that his nurse, she says, Anne put him in shorter petticoats, which show off his little stout legs very cunningly, mm -hmm. and he was immediately inspired to set off alone some steps. <laughs> so as they kept them in the long petticoats until they thought they could let them go. And as anybody who, who uh, knows Charlie knows that he never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a sampler, a, a sampler of fabrics annotated by Fanny, <coughs> I think, identifies one of the pieces in our collection as one of these short gowns. Uh, it is dated, it's this, this little polka dot fabric, I think matches um, on the sampler and on the piece. Um, and it's dated 1847 and labeled Ernie's gown and then squeezed in there, worn by F. So it's originally made for Ernie Longfellow as one of those, those short gowns uh, when he's uh, right, about, right about two. And then the worn by F indicates that she's reusing the clothing. It's a hand-me-down worn by his little sister. Um, the rest of the sampler provides evidence uh, mainly for early and Charlie, Ernie and Charlie, 
uh, up until 1850. Um, so the, the toddler stage onwards, mostly we're looking at dresses still up through these, these uh, things. There's no uh, sack, which would have been a coat, until 1850, and that's for five-year-old Charlie. So as all the, all the boys and girls are getting, it didn't matter which one she was expecting. She was preparing the same kind of clothes uh, for either of them. However, in her preparation for her nursery, a month before Charlie's arrival, she writes, records in her journal, uh, lined a basket with pink cambric for an expected guest. She reported on this to her stepmother. Uh, my basket is not yet made, I find. Mary sent me a garniture, finding they thought it useless without having the size of the thing. The smaller one I lined with pink cambric, and it is already filled and ready for use. It's a little unclear to me, based on that second, uh, second phrasing, whether this is something that she's using for storage and, and filling with things, or whether this is a, the bassinet that she's mm -hmm. expecting to put the baby in. Uh, it's a little clearer for Alice, uh, where she reports to uh, Emily, Aunt Sam has given me a beautiful bassinet lined with rose color, and complete upon a stand with pillows, blankets, etc. A very tasteful affair. So I shall not need the old one and have not sent for it. So she's still receiving gifts, even for Alice, um, from Aunt Sam, who is um, related through her father's side. Um, and again, still preparing for that girl. Which by Alice, she, she, does, she does finally get. She's preparing the, the nursery at home here. Uh, the location of the nursery varied a little bit. We know it was at the back of the house and then moved, uh, but still in proximity to the parents' bedroom. We know that she gave birth to all six of her children at home on the second floor of the Longfellow house. Uh, we know from Henry's journal entries that, they, that at least two of the children were born on the western side of the house we can infer that probably the first five were born in the parents' bedroom. Uh, we know that Edith was born uh, this morning at 5 o'clock, was born in the western chamber of Craigie House, a little girl. And when the sun rose against the clouds opposite the windows, sprang a beautiful and perfect rainbow, an auspicious sign. Uh, so we know it was this side of the house probably the parents' bedroom, the, the back side of the house. The youngest daughter, Annie, uh, we know was born at uh, eight and one half o'clock in the evening on the southwest chamber, a little girl. Uh, so she was born at the front of the house and seems to have been the odd one out um, in that choice. Uh, Fanny had a variety of attendants at her, her six births. They were mostly women, uh, especially at the beginning. Uh, there's a, one of the references I, uh, secondary sources I was looking at, uh, brought to bed by Judith Walzer Levitt, uh, identified groups of women basically based on their geographical uh, similarities, their social classes, and the access to choices they had. Fanny had the most choices out of that group. Um, she didn't exercise all of them, with the first few pregnancies, but she, uh, she certainly in this privileged uh, group of women, uh, upper class in urban centers, uh, she's, they refer to this as, as being out in the country, but she's certainly in proximity to an urban center where she, she could have gotten uh, any resources she needed. Uh, she knew leading doctors in the obstetrics field, including all, uh, Dr. Oliver Wilkinson Holmes and Dr. Walter Channing. Uh, it's unclear what intervention she was actively seeking uh, or rejecting. Um, she, like I said at the beginning, didn't have her mother. Um, she didn't seem ready to call on her stepmother. Uh, her stepmother's youngest child was born a year before Fanny's oldest child, which gives you an idea of their age gap. Uh, so that changes their relationship a little bit. And Harriet has 
a baby at home, so she's not ready to drop everything and come out to Cambridge. Uh, Fanny's maternal aunt, her mother's sister, Martha Gold, filled the role of family attendant for at least one birth, um, the, the birth of Ernie. I'm not sure if she actually attended the birth and assisted, but she was living at, with them at the house for a period of time around the birth, uh, and she was definitely acting as hostess and housekeeper in Fanny's place, uh, relieving Fanny to uh, have that period of confinement and recovery after the birth. Uh, Mrs. Blake makes an appearance with almost every birth of the children. Uh, she had apparently been Fanny's nurse as a child, and she seems, seems to be acting as a baby nurse. She does come out before the birth of Charlie to live in the house. Um, she's with, with Fanny for the early weeks of most of the other babies. Uh, whether she's actually delivering the baby or uh, just giving the immediate follow-up nursing care while Fanny is, is recovering isn't quite clear to me. By 1847, uh, with her third birth, Fanny changes her choices quite radically. Uh, Ether has just been discovered as a uh, anesthetic. Uh, the Longfellows go to several different uh, physicians to see if anybody's tried it, and nobody, nobody has and nobody's willing to, uh, except for Dr. Nathan Keep, a uh, dentist, uh, very involved with this, the School of Dentistry at Harvard, uh, who agrees to come out and deliver either experimentally. Um, I don't know who else was attending the, that birth besides Dr. Keep, uh, but we know the most about that birth in terms of details because of that pioneering aspect of it. Uh, for Alice's birth, she refers to my nurse and doctor. So again, she seems to be using that, bringing the male doctor into the birthing room. Uh, and she refers a couple of times to a Miss Alexander. And this is one of the points where the historical record is frustratingly incomplete, because I can't figure out who Miss Alexander was. I can assume from context that she was a midwife, uh, that, that she was coming out to assist the birth. Uh, but midwives aren't listed in the city directories. Uh, and I wasn't able to track her down in the census. Uh, so I can only suppose that from the context. Uh, that Fanny was using uh, a nurse or midwife, Miss Alexander, and by this point a doctor. And we know that with Alice, she also used ether for pain relief. Um, she seemed to continue to do that. She seemed to really like that plan. <laughs> um, she pioneered its use. Uh, she used it for, it documented, I was able to track down at least baby Fanny and baby Alice. Based on her advocacy of it and uh, Three months after uh, her delivery of baby Fanny, she wrote, Mrs. John Bryant, a friend, has an ethereal baby. They are now becoming too common to be counted. So I suspect that the last two she used ether and just didn't think it was worth noting by that point. Um, you know, seven years after the first use, it was becoming widespread. This is this is my filler slide that I didn't click to. This is a, a sketch that's attributed to Fanny of a baby. Uh, this is Fanny's uh, postpartum handwriting, with apparently a very bad pen. Uh, writing to Ann Pierce, uh, trying to explain herself after having used this new and untried chemical uh, during her labor. She says, I am very sorry you thought you all thought me so rash and naughty in trying either. <laughs> Henry's faith gave me courage, and I had heard such a thing had succeeded abroad, where the surgeons extend this great blessing more boldly and universally than our timid doctors. Yeah. Two other ladies I know have since followed my example successfully, and I feel proud to be the pioneer to less, to less suffering for poor, weak womankind. This is certainly the greatest blessing of this age, and I am glad to have lived at the time of its coming and in the country which gives it to the world. So 
don't know about that poor, weak women kind <laughs> characterization. Uh, and she's not a poor, weak yeah. example of a woman by any means. Uh, that's the Victorian social wars coming out. We have the other side of it too, because this is experimental. This is uh, down here, N.C. Keep, published April 10th, 1847, days after Baby Fanny's birth. Uh, this is in the um, Boston Medical and Surgical Journal. It focuses on the delivery of the ether and how exactly it was used. Uh, the, the, the lithion administered in a case of labor. Uh, so he talks about what the inhaler was and how it was actually delivered. But this tells us that Fanny's labor was six hours in total. Uh, the ether was used for the last half hour, uh, in which case, during that time, in the course of 20 minutes, four pains had occurred without suffering, the vapor of ether being administered between each pain. And then they stopped it, because this is an experiment, so we'll see if anything changes, and according to this, oh boy, it changes. Um, and they tried to administer ether for that, uh, those last contractions. Um, he admits that the, uh, the, system, uh, the progress of the labor was so rapid that time could not be found for sufficient inhalation to bring the system perfectly under its influence, but the sufferings of the last moments were greatly mitigated. Um, so this is, this is an intervention that Fanny has actively chosen. And again, it's because she belongs to that privileged class where she has the access to those choices. Um, but again, bring, bring it back to the modern day, our choices are going to depend on what hospital we have access to, what, what social class in some cases we belong to, uh, but there's a menu of choices available to you and you, you make the best decisions based on what you know. Uh, sounds like Fanny would have been a fan of the epidural <laughs> if she had, had that option. Uh, and she was, uh, certainly interested in uh, improving pain relief during labor. After delivery, uh, Fanny's recovery period included uh, a period of confinement to her room. Uh, Henry was sleeping uh, elsewhere in the house during this period. It varied to, uh, by pregnancy or by birth. Uh, based on her health and any setbacks she experienced. In one case, she had a fever and it, um, her recovery took a little longer. Uh, it varied from about 28 days to 35 days. Which, so a period of confinement to your room sounds very Victorian, sounds um, like something we would never do today, but that's actually just a little bit shy of the six week recovery period uh, that's generally expected uh, for an uncomplicated delivery today. Mm. We don't expect the, the mother to not dine downstairs uh, anymore. <laughs> uh, but she's, she's taking that physical recovery period. Um, and it's, it's really a time when she's physically wiped out and, and needs that time um, to herself, uh, needs that time not entertaining. Uh, she does report out to, she's, she begins to do, pick up her correspondence uh, during her recovery periods. Uh, after baby Fanny is born, uh, again, people are extra concerned after baby Fanny's born because she's tried this new radical thing. Uh, she writes to Ann Pierce, I am very glad to be able at length to confirm Henry's accounts of my well-being with my own hand and to assure you all that I never was better or got through a confinement so comfortably. It must be a tedious thing at the best, and I am rejoiced to be about again and to be as strong enough to enjoy my new treasure. Uh, after Alice's birth, she writes uh, to her mother-in-law, I have not written you since my convalescence. I am now about the house again and remarkably well, having had no drawbacks and recovering my strength steadily and surely. Her recovery with Edith was more complicated. Um, that's one where she, she did have a fever that um, it seemed to slow down her recovery, although um, not dangerously. She wrote after, during that recovery, this, 
I couldn't pin down exactly when her confinement period would have ended for this one, uh, but she wrote quite a while after uh, Edith's birth. I have not yet driven out, nor dined downstairs but once, and feel in no haste to leave my pleasant chamber. Again, this is baby number five, uh, but the experience is a little different than, than the others. Um, so by this time, she's, she's welcoming the confinement a little bit more. This confinement also happens during the winter, um, in particular with her babies, her couple of babies born during the summer, she regrets missing out on summer. Um, she's, she writes in the fall that she's happy to see the trees changing, she loves, she loves the changing of the season, but it's reminding her that she missed half the summer. So then we have the fun part. The baby's born, all the hard work's been done, and we get to announce it to the world. <laughs> uh, this is, this is actually a, this is actually Alice, but clearly this is not um, the actual announcement. I have a, a series of Henry's announcements because again, Fanny was um, tasked with recovering. That was her job at this point. Henry got to do, share the good news. Um, he writes to Harriet Sumner Appleton, Fanny's mo uh, stepmother. Uh, Henry had been on a unfortunate uh, trip up to Portland uh, the evening before Alice was born. Um, his brother was dying and then uh, did die in Portland, and so he was making a quick trip up there, but trying to balance it when he knew that his wife was about to go into labor really any moment. Um, so he does just a day trip up to the funeral of his brother, comes home, and he writes, I reached home last night at 11, and just in season it was. For this morning, at half past six, a daughter made her triumphant entry into Castle Preggy. Or should I call it a stolen march, for so rapid it was it that I came very near being the only person present. Mm -hmm. Fanny is quite comfortably, comfortable and went through the Auguste Martyr de la Maternité with heroic fortitude. To his mother, who he just left, he writes, I reached home at 11, not much tired, luckily, for at half past four this morning, I was up again, and at half past six, a little daughter was born at Castle Craggy. So with Alice, Fanny's only having two hours of active labor, at least that she's letting Henry know about. It could have been a little longer than that. Uh, and then in the male circles, uh, to James T. Field, his publisher, two days after Alice's birth, he writes, I reached home on Saturday night, and on Sunday morning received a presentation copy of a daughter. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> so for infant care, there's, Fanny is, is uh, really interested in reporting on her precious little darlings uh, to friends and family. Uh, so fortunately, there's more information about infants and the toddlers and what they did as they grew up. She's reporting to all these aunts and uncles that are spread out um, than there is on the, the um, more subtextual experience of pregnancy. This is uh, Fanny's high chair, which was given to Charles Longfellow on his first birthday by Aunt Sam. Um, so on his first birthday, this is a little bit older. Uh, Fanny attempted with all of her children uh, to to nurse herself. She had a mixed success in maintaining a supply of breast milk for her, her babies, and she didn't have the choice that we have today of the scientifically engineered, uh, balanced uh, formulas. Uh, for, subs for substituting or supplementing, uh, she was using, she referred to groats, cereals, uh, and her other alternatives were animal milk. Uh, she also seemed to have the other universal of new mothers, unsolicited advice. Uh, in the area of nursing, that seems to have been her mother-in-law. Uh, she writes, after the birth of Charlie, writing through Ann Pierce, she, Zilba, will be interested to know that I have rejected groats for the baby and inflict no pressure and good milk upon his delicate stomach. Uh, for Ernie, I have nursed him 
Ernest entirely until this week when I found myself obliged to give him a drop of the bottle and he has thriven famously. So she's supplementing with, I mean, it's unclear what's in that bottle, but it's not formula. It's, it's either animal milk or some kind of um, cereal grains. On baby Fanny, again writing through Ann Pierce, hinting to, to Zilpa, she is very fat and they make a better nurse than ever before. This for Grandmamba, to whom I best love. <laughs> um, Alice apparently was very hungry. I nurse about as well as usual, but Miss Alice, as I think we shall call her, is such a ravenous young lady that the bottle has to come into service in, in the 24 hours. Uh, so she continues to, to try to nurse and be accepting of supplementing, and then uh, the children move downstairs somewhat, occasionally, uh, dining with the, <coughs> or dining with the, uh, the nurse. In that last quote, I said, Miss Alice, as I think we shall call her, this is one of the, I think, the big differences in Fanny's experience. She didn't pick a name before any of the children were born, I think. She might have had some in mind, uh, but their namings coincide with Christmas, uh, which occurred when the babies were seven months old, uh, between about four and seven months. Uh, it looks like some of the kids went as baby for seven months after birth. <laughs> Uh, before they could decide. Uh, as a religious ceremony, the christenings were very important to Fanny. Uh, she had her children christened by men she, she was very close to. Uh, Mr. Gannett of the Boston Church she had grown, uh, grown up in, in uh, Dr. Converse Francis of Harvard, and her brother-in-law, Reverend Sam Longfellow, uh, baptized a couple of her children. She wrote uh, in October 1844, so this is four months after his birth, to her brother. Last week, the young Hyperion became a Christian. Mr. Gannett baptized him, and he bore the, Christ the ceremony with truly Christian resignation. Instead of crying, he laughed, at times chuckled most indecorously. We gave him a sit-down déjeuner afterwards, and drank his health in the crimson and gold goblet. Aunt Sam presented him a beautiful cup of old silver, and Aunt Sally another with a spoon. His name is simply Charles, it being long enough with that. And we have those two cups in the collection. Uh, this, I believe, would be the one, it's dated circa 1844, so right, it was new at the time, um, engraved across of Charles Longfellow, given probably by Aunt Sally, who's not, who's an honorary aunt. And then this one, uh, with also has CAL there, is heavily engraved. It's dated to about 1786, um, and has MTG on the bottom. Um, it's a family heirloom from the, the Gold and then the Appleton family. The MTG is Fanny's mother. Um, so these are our physical representations of that naming process. So apparently they, they chose the name early enough to go ahead and get the engraving done. Uh, the choice of names seemed to be as challenging for them as it is today. Um, they debated family names, historic names, uh, they threw around some romantic names, although they uh, ended up not using any of those. Uh, they chose largely from family traditions. Uh, Charles was probably named for Fanny's brother, who had died uh, in the 1830s, Charles Cedric Appleton. He is Charles Appleton Longfellow. Uh, Ernie, Ernest doesn't come from the family, but Wadsworth was the middle name, uh, certainly does. Maybe Fanny is, of course, for her mother. Alice was named for several of the Appletons, <laughs> and Annie, I suspect, was named for Anne Longfellow Pierce. Uh, again, that, that closest of Fanny's sisters in law. Uh, Anne Pierce, again, gave unsolicited advice. Uh, on Ernie, she wrote, Be sure and name him Henry Wadsworth. I must insist that Henry has one name for himself and try to persuade him that one little Harry here was no reason for refusing a child of his own name. Um, Henry already had a nephew, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and apparently he decided that he didn't want to steal uh, or reuse the name uh, within the generation and, and selected Ernest. The third daughter, who turns out to be Edith, seemed to be the most challenging to name. 
uh, Fanny Ray. We are puzzled for a name. Grace and Rose are proposed. Papa, Nathan Appleton, fancies the latter, romantic as it is, but Henry thinks it rather barmaidy. <laughs> <laughs> Anne tries in with some advice. Passing on advice, actually. What do you think Aunt says you must name your baby if christened on the 22nd? Martha Washington. <laughs> uh, and Alice was indeed christened on uh, February 22nd. Uh, or, excuse me. But uh, they, they opted not to, to use that advice. By the time of Edith's christening, they, they'd settled on uh, Edith. Fanny writes, the Saxon name of Edith fits well baby's fair, sunny countenance and blue eyes. It was Henry's choice. So here we have a we know that, um, and again, Fanny repeats, Fanny's very clear that Henry picked this one. Um, she reported of the christening, baby behaved charmingly, cooing gently all the while, and with her fair sunny countenance and blue eyes, answered well to her Saxon name, Edith, which Henry inclined to give her. Henry also reflected some of those other considered names in his journal uh, for the, the next baby, the last one, the baby christened, simply Annie, discarding the romantic sibyls and roses and lilians, which have floated through our fancies. So they stuck with, with mostly some traditional family names. Um, not Martha Washington. <laughs> and lastly, I want to uh, recognize some of the other help, the other mother figures, maternal figures that Fanny had in her uh, in her arsenal. And this is Alice, at about a year old, pictured with Rachel Kiernahan. The Longfellow family had a nurse for the kids uh, who did a lot of the day-to-day -day work, did a lot of the diaper changing, uh, a lot of the feeding that wasn't uh, breastfeeding. Uh, the, Rachel was with the family uh, from 1851 to 1859, uh, so pretty consistent presence in their lives. Uh, so Fanny began with a baby nurse and continued on with a, a hired nurse, a live-in help, uh, helping to take care of the children. And if we remember Fanny's earlier question, one of her fears, can any child excite as strong passion as this we feel for each other? The answer seems to have been a really resounding yes. She threw herself into motherhood. This is the last entry in that uh, 1844 journal. It's written on the anniversary of our wedding day. Celebrated it right joyfully by my first drive abroad with baby, Henry, nurse, and Tom, and our first dinner in the dining room. What a year this, this day completed. What a golden chain of months and days and with this diamond clasp, born a month ago. I wonder if these old walls ever looked upon happier faces or threw them down into happier hearts. Fanny was very content with the, the beginning of her journey of motherhood, uh, which would continue on uh, through the rest of her life. I'm happy to take any questions. I think I'll except that that's the name that Henry picked. Um, I know Edith herself wasn't thrilled about it later in life and tried <laughs> to adopt a middle name briefly. Uh, unfortunately for us, she chose Wadsworth, giving her the same initials as her brother. Uh, so for a period of time, there's a little bit of confusion there. Um, but I don't know why they opted for the only one not to give her a second name. Clearly they had enough trouble coming up with one. <laughs> we can throw in Rose. <laughs> what was the least ambiguous term that she would have used for being pregnant? Expecting. Um, she, when she announces, uh, I hope to give you a little nephew. Uh, she, with her, the other announcement, she says, I expect to be confined. Um, that's, that's her language for it. 
I don't think I ever saw the word pregnancy, labor, um, anything that's really explicit. Yeah. Well, they couldn't even use the word pregnant on American TV in the 1950s. <laughs> Including the medical journal. So we, we do see that uh, the most explicit language is used by uh, the dentist, the doctor, reporting on his medical use of, of either. Uh, other than that, it's all uh, this use of euphemisms, but it's standardly accepted euphemisms, so it's pretty clear what they're talking about. Anything else? Yeah. I wanted to comment that your, I think the whole concept of this talk is brilliant. And your feelings about your own, so using yourself as a vehicle for getting into her spirit. I mean, I know you had it. You, you paid a lot of attention to her before, but uh, I think it would make a lovely book by a, as a, a piece. <laughs> I wanted to make a comment on two of the drawings. The baby drawings that you showed, uh, the pencil drawings, yeah. are from 1832, and they're the Lieber's children. They're not oh. her own children. Okay. I couldn't find the date on them. And they're part of a set. Okay, that makes sense. They, if you look in that set, there's, there's it says Mrs. L and Mr. L and Oscar the baby. I liked that it illustrated the, uh, the long skirts down the front. So this is a, a younger child. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to add that to my notes. So this is both for the MD. Oh. <laughs>